Okay, we are live. So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Michael Pollenberg. I'm the VP of Government Affairs at Safe Horizon. I'm joined by the wonderful Bridie Farrell, um, who uh, together we're going to um, lead a discussion with a group of wonderful attorneys to talk to us about the Adult Survivors Act, to answer questions that often come up, and to hopefully provide some answers as survivors and family members and friends and loved ones are considering um, what actions to take, if any, now that the Adult Survivors Act is law. Um, Bridie, do you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Uh, hi, Michael, and thank you to all of our attorneys that have come on with us today um, and to everyone watching. My name is Bridie Farrell. I got to work with Michael and his crew uh, initially working on the Child Victims Act in New York State. I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse myself. Uh, since that bill has passed, I have had the experience of finding counsel, uh, Right, you know, working through the process of this whole thing and learning how hard, in fact, it is to uh, be a litigant in the case and make that decision to move forward. So I'm really excited to help um, share the insight I've personally learned and bring some of the best and brightest attorneys that we have working on these cases in New York State on the Adult Survivors Act, uh, which the window will be opening in November for one year. Thank you, Bridie. Um, so we're going to um, talk a little bit, very briefly, about some background about the uh, about the bill, and then we're going to turn it over to our panel of attorneys to introduce themselves, to talk about why the Adult Survivors Act is so important to them, uh, and then we have a series of questions. These are questions that come up. Uh, they came up when the Child Victims Act passed, and we anticipate they'll come up again with the Adult Survivors Act. Um, so just by way of quick background, first I should say that uh, Safe Horizon is the nation's largest nonprofit victim services organization. We help upwards of 250,000 New Yorkers each year who've experienced violence or abuse. Um, we are in over 100 locations in New York City and we provide a client-centered trauma-informed response to survivors of violence and abuse. Um, the Adult Survivors Act is in fact uh, the latest step in the state legislature's reckoning with outdated and ineffective statutes of limitations for survivors of sexual violence. In 2006, the state legislature eliminated the statute of limitations for rape in the first degree and a, a, a few other felony sex crimes. In 2019, of course, the state legislature passed the Child Victims Act, which um, expanded the statute of limitations in both civil and criminal proceedings for survivors of child sex abuse and also created a one year look back window, which was later extended for another year because of COVID. So survivors who were time barred were able to seek justice in civil court. That same year in 2019, the legislature um, extended both the civil and criminal statutes of limitations for a number of felony sex offenses. So the Adult Survivors Act was really the next step in, the, in a process that has taken many years of the legislature looking at the laws and looking at the experiences of survivors and seeing a mismatch. Um, and I wanna turn it over to Bridie to talk about what the Child Victims Act meant for her personally. Um, that's such a big, huge question for me, what it meant for me um, personally. I, a little background on myself, I was a speed skater growing up and um, was abused in the Olympic speed skating move movement. Um, and speed skating is a sport made up of winners and losers at the end of every race. And when the Child Victims Act passed, and I remember standing on the, the staircase with um, Jessica Shafroth and Michael and um, Brad Hoyleman and Marge Markey and turning around and seeing all of the advocates that have worked so hard for this, I realized that um, it was just bigger than anything I've ever done in my whole life. And while I'd always been an athlete that had focused on a goal, the, the reward of that goal was always like very um, personal and selfish where this success was just massive. And to say that we had, I believe it's around 11,000 survivors that came forward in New York state and filed cases to know that we were able to touch that many 
lives is just huge and massive. At the same time, New York State's population is pretty large and we should have more than that at the same time. And so maybe that's the athlete in me that it wasn't enough. And so I really hope that with the Adult Survivors Act, we're able to reach out to more people and um, bring more people to, to the table to be able to hold the abusers and institutions accountable. Um, personally, I'm in a, actively in litigation myself and it's challenging, but it's also very empowering and it's how we make systemic change, I believe in our culture. And I couldn't do that without the help of amazing attorneys, which is why I'm really appreciative to have the folks gather today um, that do hard, hard work day in and day out on just really, really, um, on really tough matters. Thanks, Bridie. Um, so we're going to now get to this wonderful panel of attorneys. I'm going to ask each uh, attorney to introduce themselves and to tell us uh, in a few words why they think the ASA is so important. So I'm going to start with Marianne Wang. Marianne? Hi, everyone. Uh, Mary Ann Wong. It's uh, spelled W-A-N-G. Um, and I'm at a small firm, QD Hacker Wong, and I couldn't put it any better than Bertie just put it. I think that um, it's so the ASA is so important because first of sexual abuse and violence is so prevalent, but it remains so hidden. Um, and the way that the trauma is processed takes so many years for so many people. It's, it's not um, the way it is in TV movies or, um, and so deadlines did not make sense. And then ultimately the only way to change society is through these individual um, through individuals holding people to account, holding perpetrators and institutions to account. So I think, I thank um, Safe Horizons, I thank Birdie, I thank, I thank all the survivors who've, who've made this happen. Uh, it's, it's really tough work, but it's, it's so important um, and can be very rewarding. Thank you, Marianne, and apologies, apologies for uh, getting your last name. No worries. <laughs> um, I'd like to turn it over to Kat Thomas, please. Good morning, my name is Kat Thomas. I'm an attorney with Thomas Counselors at Law, um, and we represent exclusively victims of sexual violence. And Michael, thank you so much for doing this, and thank you, Bridie. It's, um, yeah, to just to echo, I, I, that was an amazing introduction and I, um, everything you said rings true. Um, uh, the Adult Survivors Act is very important to me. We have been litigating for since the Child Victim Act open um, on these uh, cases that are finally able to, um, we're able to bring under this window. Um, I, I, yeah, we see it a lot, like the trauma and the manifestations of trauma keep people from reporting. And not just that, I mean, as we know, there's a huge, right now, US Department of Justice investigation, thanks to some attorneys on this panel and to how NYPD handles um, adult survivor rape cases and, and sexual violence cases um, in, in New York. And so there's, it's not just the trauma. I mean, it's like for, folks to come forward, there's so many obstacles. Um, they're so, they're disbelieved every step of the way. And so to be an advocate is um, a big deal and and uh, and be able to, and for these uh, survivors to finally come forward. And I love seeing the changes that have, we have have been able to make for people and personally. And then, you know, even like uh, little examples like because someone filed a lawsuit, we finally have cameras at a um, respite center where there were no cameras before, things like that, like it does force change. So I'm, I'm really, really grateful for all the work for everyone that opened the window. Thanks so much, Kat. Um, Carrie Goldberg. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Carrie Goldberg. I'm the owner of Victims Rights Law Firm, CA Goldberg PLLC and the author of um, a book called Nobody's Victim, Fighting Psychos, Stalkers, Pervs, and Trolls. Um, our firm fights for survivors of stalking, sexual assault, and harassment online and off. And we go after schools, big tech, and powerful predators. Um, we've had the privilege of working with Safe Horizon and uh, many of the other powerhouses on this webinar since the very inception of the ASA. And we're so grateful that we're finally at the point where 
were about to storm the courts with these really important cases. And the ASA is, is personally very important to me um, because I'm both a lawyer, but I'm also a survivor who is grappling with the major decision of whether I'll be personally using the ASA. Um, and I'm gonna talk later on about um, some of the, the risks and the, the um, things to keep in mind when, when bringing litigations like this. Um, what I love about the ASA is that um, my life is dedicated to the idea that if somebody hurts you, that they have to pay. And it pains me that um, in this world uh, where we accept lawsuits, of if you're hurt in a car accident or if a product injures you, um, but somehow there's so much skepticism in our society um, if the harm relates to sexual assault or, or domestic violence. And the people who bring those suits are, are wrongly dismissed as gold diggers, as liars, opportunists, man haters. Um, and we finally have the ASA. It's a statute and it gives license and permission um, for people to get justice through our courts for the sexual injuries, which are true injuries. Thank you so much, Carrie. Uh, Laura Edden. Thank you, Michael. Um, my name is Laura Edden, and I'm of counsel with the law firm of Wigdor LLP, where we represent plaintiffs in employment discrimination, sexual harassment, and sexual assault lawsuits. Before I joined the firm, I spent 25 years in the public sector representing and advocating on behalf of crime victims. Uh, and in particularly victims of sexual abuse. Uh, and that in includes um, stints as a federal and a local prosecutor. I think the opportunity that's afforded victims by the Adult Survivors Act is an incredibly precious one and something that people on this call advocated for uh, very strongly. And the reason why it's so precious is that it gives a second chance for people who weren't able to bring their lawsuits to have their voices heard, to hold abusers and importantly, their enablers accountable, to change the conversation about sexual abuse, and also to help make sure that other people aren't abused. And in this very narrow, precious year that we have to file these claims. Um, my hope and my expectation is that the voices of survivors will be amplified in a way that has powerful change uh, beyond their individual case as Bridie described. Very happy to be here today. Thank you so much, Laura. Kevin Mincer. Thank you, Michael. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. My name is Kevin Mincer. I am the principal attorney of the law office of Kevin Mincer. Um, we have for um, about 25 years been representing um, plaintiffs in employment discrimination, sexual harassment, and um, sexual assault cases. Um, echo the other panelists on the importance of the Adult Survivors Act. For me, it really comes down to um, empowering survivors and giving them a choice where they didn't have a choice before. Um, a lawsuit, as we were gonna all, all talk about, is not necessarily for everyone. Um, and that's a perfectly valid choice not to, de to decide not to bring a claim if you choose not to. But the point is, is that survivors should have a choice. And the ASA gives them a choice that they didn't have before this legislation has passed. And I think um, there's no um, overstating what that can do for people who want to pursue accountability and want to pursue justice. And um, I hope that's what we're going to talk about today and accomplish um, through this law. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kevin. And last but not least, Jeff Fritz. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us here today. Um, you know, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I've been practicing 25 years in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, representing survivors uh, in cases and sexual assault cases, children and adult survivors. And, you know, through that experience, one thing I've come to learn about the impact of civil lawsuits uh, 
is a lot of times for the kind of the reasons the Adult Survivors Act was passed, um, there was no criminal prosecution. And um, we can't in this country go back and change the statute of limitations on crimes, but we can in civil cases. And that's what everybody's been able to do here. And that's what's helpful about the Adult Survivors Act is it in a lot of times is the only way that a survivor can see any kind of justice. So it might not put a criminal behind bars because the statute of limitations is gone, but civilly, if this is the way it gives survivors a, a voice and the ability, and it, it's never about money. I, I've never had any victim call me up and say, hey, I wanna sue, I wanna get money. It's about justice. And this is in a lot of cases, the only way justice can be served. Thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for uh, introductions. I hope that's helpful to folks that are watching to give perspective of the breadth and experience that all of our lawyers have. Um, we have a few questions that we've thought of we wanna go through and just listening to the intros makes me think of so many more. So I'm just gonna ask that everyone answers the questions um, to the point so I, we can get through as many as possible and be as quick um, as your answers as, as you can. Um, I think of, of something as both a survivor and just hearing calls from so many people, someone, what I'm asked so many times is why, like, why should I even bring a case? And, um, Marianne, I don't remember if you recall that me calling you maybe five or seven years or something like that ago and having a conversation, um, with you, of, about this and, um, you had such knowledge and expertise. So I, I would love to direct this question at you. Why? Why should someone out there who's um, had some horrible experience bring a case? Thank you. I, I think a lot of what we all just talked about in our introductions sort of speak to it, but I think um, why bring it the most immediate reason is because you've been harmed and because you want to hold the person who harmed you accountable or hold the institution that enabled that perpetrator accountable. Um, and in our in our um, system of civil lawsuits, as um, as was mentioned, we don't this does not open up criminal prosecutions. It only opens up civil lawsuits. That is a process that can be public. So there can be a public accounting. In other words, you file a case that will be um, on a docket and can be um, a, a public accounting of what has happened to you. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, ultimately at the end of it, if you win, uh, the perpetrator or the institutions that enable the perpetrator have to pay money. And as Carrie said, although there is mostly due to defendants and institutions, um, a lot of shame around um, the, the idea that you get money um, in exchange for, for this trauma, the reality is in the American system of law, that is the way that you punish people. Um, and there's nothing at all shameful about the fact that you can get money both to help yourself uh, get help or to better your, li your life, as well as a, a means of punishing in a way the, the, um, the perpetrator and, and holding them accountable. Um, that said, as many people have also said in their introductions, I think you know the, those are the some of the whys, and of course, um, others and survivors can also speak to to um, to more you know other reasons. The bigger, larger reason is the only way we can make systemic change is to make these types of um, wrongs and traumas more transparent, and also how they happen. So that the that people in society understand better uh, that there is no one way that they happen and that they are sometimes much more subtle and much more complicated than what you see in the movies. That that also that process of litigating these cases is a way of educating society um, and getting people to understand it better. That said, as everyone has or met, most people have alluded to. You also have to weigh the pros and cons for yourself as a litigant, and that is something you really have to think about hard, and you have to make sure that you have a lawyer, as somebody else will talk about, that you trust who is counseling you through this, because 
bringing litigation is a huge undertaking um, and it is a fight. It is engaging in an active fight often against um, perpetrators and institutions that have enormous amount of resources. Um, and it's of course, one of the reasons why perpetrators <laughs> engage in their abuse because they have so much, um, so many resources and so much hubris and often the, there's a reason for that. Um, and so you just have to be really aware going in what the pros and cons of, of that are. And one of the first things that will happen is, is understanding whether or not you actually have a claim. Um, and legally, you, you just have to go through the steps of analyzing that with a lawyer. Um, so not every single um, sexual grooming or even sexual offense that we understand as lay people may necessarily satisfy what is has been revived under the ASA, just to be very, um, I'll keep it relatively general and, and hopefully brief, as has been said, the Adult Survivors Act opens the civil claim for a year. Um, that one year window is for claims that are based on facts that have to satisfy the New York penal law code, which is called section 130. And when you look at that um, provision of law, that's a criminal, um, a set of criminal provisions that define certain types of sexual abuse. And nearly all of those um, acts they require specific types of sexual touching and specific types of intent. And therefore not everything that actually is potentially even extremely abusive and harmful falls into this category. It was a way the legislature had to undertake to sort of narrow it. It doesn't mean there's still enormous amounts that can be pursued, but that is the kind of thing that you would go through with a lawyer to actually speak to um, what you actually experienced in the abuse incidents themselves, which can be very difficult to talk about with a total stranger, but um, is something that you'll have to go through. Um, and the other piece of it is um, whether or not you can bring a case against an institution that may have enabled the perpetrator. Oftentimes, as I often say, um, and uh, Bertie, you may have even heard me, it's it, there are many bad people in the world and many perpetrators, but it is often, in my view, the institutions that enable these perpetrators that um, I, I feel need even more to be held to account because there's always going to be bad people in the world. But if we all stand by and and let that happen, that that's, in my view, uh, in, in some way, it's, it's not worse, but it's the way to prevent it from happening in the future is if, if we could make sure that yeah. the enablers were stopped. Anyway, yeah. I, I won't continue, but I will just say that negligence is also something that is actually fairly limit, limiting in some ways under New York law. And it's something also that your lawyer would go over with you to go over the facts to determine whether you you know whether you have a good case because you don't want to proceed with a case that you're just going to be fighting like mad and then to lose it at the end um so these are difficult questions but thank you Marianne, um, I'm going to jump to the next question uh, for Laura. Um, we sort of um, one of the biggest questions we heard over and over was how to find an attorney. There's so many advertisements that come out when bills like this pass, and and so much to look for. Um, what would you suggest is the best way to things to look for when you're selecting an attorney for Laura? Thanks, Michael. Um, in my experience working with survivors of sexual abuse. I've just seen time and again that it can be incredibly powerful and healing to speak your truth, to hold the abuser and his enablers to account, and as a result, prevent others from being abused. So at a very high level, it's important to hire a lawyer who is an expert in working on cases involving sexual abuse, um, who you trust, and who understands the significance of your case to you. An attorney who's expert in sexual assault cases is also best suited to navigate the unique legal and proof issues that may arise in your case. So for example, an attorney with significant experience litigating these kinds of cases will be skilled in working with expert witnesses who can help a jury understand why survivors of sexual abuse 
may not come forward and report um, or may continue to stay in touch with the person who abused them. If the person who abused you is someone you worked with at the time of the abuse, I recommend you work with an attorney who's an expert in employment law. When sexual misconduct occurs in the workplace, there are additional layers of legal complexity. So an attorney with a deep knowledge of employment law will be well suited to hold employers uh, and institutions accountable for enabling abuse. You know, as Marianne just discussed, to bring a civil claim under the Adult Survivors Act, the abuse must meet the definition of certain sex crimes. So I, I think it's extremely advantageous to hire a lawyer who has prosecuted sex crimes. Uh, for example, prosecutors may bring a related criminal case while your civil case is ongoing. In that situation, you want your lawyer to understand how to work with the prosecutor so that you're properly prepared if called to testify in a criminal trial. Uh, that was a situation with two women we represented who testified at the trial where Harvey Weinstein was convicted. Um, the founder of our firm uh, is a former prosecutor and uh, he and I have spoken about the fact that we draw on our experiences as former prosecutors doing this work every day. Um, for me, that was time I spent as a sex crimes prosecutor um, but I do think that that is um, something to look for in an attorney. Now, in some cases, um, you may be up against defendants with significant resources who will try to intimidate you and your lawyer. Um, you know, in particular, I'm thinking about uh, recent cases we had against Bill O'Reilly, um, the billionaire Leon Black, Uber, um, large Wall Street banks. Um, when you're coming up against those kind of resources, you need a firm who has the fortitude and resources of its own to go toe to toe with a powerful party on the other side. So look for firms that have longevity, that have proven they can go the distance um, and firms that have the ability to bring in re reinforcements if needed. Uh, for example, our firm and, and Kevin's firm partnered to represent victims of Harvey Weinstein I know others on the call uh, have worked as co-counsel on cases. Um, and I know for our part, I think Kevin would agree that the representation our clients received was enriched by the fact that there was more than one firm on their case. We brought different experiences, different backgrounds and views to the table. Also, when you're holding powerful people or institutions to account, um, press coverage is to be expected. There's gonna be a public scrutiny. Um, you may have read coverage um, of a lawsuit brought, brought by our client, Trooper One, who was suing former Governor Cuomo for sexual harassment, um, or, or even um, the women that Marianne Wong is representing, who also accused the former governor of sexual misconduct. And the idea of there being press on your case can be really daunting. Um, but if you seek out a lawyer who's experienced in high profile cases, she can work with you and with the press to make sure that your narrative is amplified. Um, in closing, I, I first wanna thank Safe Horizon for putting together a, ro a roster of really top-notch lawyers uh, for today. Um, I respect each and every one of you and the work that you've done on behalf of survivors. Um, for the people watching, you could hire any one of the lawyers on this panel and be in excellent hands. I would also recommend to you the National Crime Victim Bar Association. It's a professional organization of lawyers who represent crime victims in civil cases, and they offer a free refer excuse me a free lawyer referral service. So um, you can find them uh, more information about them on the internet, um, and it is a wonderful service that they offer. For survivors whose claims have expired, the Adult Survivors Act is a singular opportunity to regain a sense of control over what happened to you. Hire someone who understands the power and significance of this moment for you. Laura, thank you so much. I mean, those are all huge, huge things to think about when hiring attorneys. I think um, one of the things that you made a really good point about is the collaboration between firms and needing to have a big firm that has the resources to go up against big players, but also needing to have boutique firms that 
work very intimately um, with clients as well. So having just the, the difference, and you said that you in fact partnered with Kevin's firm. So Kevin, maybe could you help us to understand what's the process like? And I know this is a challenge for all of you lawyers on the firm, on the call, but to use the most basic English as possible, because, um, you know, dockets and things of this nature and filing and claims and all this stuff. I mean, in, in my process, I've had to learn this whole new vocabulary. And so if you could, as simply as possible, just what the heck does this process look like? Yes. Uh, thank you, Bridie. Appreciate that. And um, it, it, it's no no doubt that this is a daunting process. And um, it, when you speak to a lawyer, I think that it's it's natural to sort of to sometimes feel um, overwhelmed by what it looks like um, going forward. But let me try to just generally um, distill it um, so that um, survivors understand what they're looking at going forward. There's a couple of different ways to, to look at this kind of process. I divide it into a couple of categories. One would be steps that you can take before filing a lawsuit, and then steps obviously associated with a lawsuit if you decide in connection with the attorney that you hire to go forward. So before filing a lawsuit, right? Let's say you 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 hire a lawyer. The lawyer learns about your case. The lawyer now understands your case. Um, typically speaking, the first thing that the lawyer is going to do for you and to initiate your case is to write a letter to um, make contact with the prospective defendants, and that could obviously be the perpetrator in a case like this, and also the institutions that have been um, negligent in allowing the the, uh, the perpetrator to do what they did. And you know, lawyers typically refer to that as a demand letter. Um, and a demand letter will um, essentially, it, lawyers have different styles and there's not one way to do it, but um, will will in most cases set out the, the basic facts of the claim and the legal theories that the, the lawyer intends to pursue on the client's behalf. And then in suggests um, that there may be um, a reason to have some dialogue about trying to negotiate or settle the claim. Um, typically speaking, in most cases like this, there is an effort to try to settle cases before a lawsuit. Um, now, I should add, it doesn't have to be that way. If you are a survivor out there and your goal is to bring a lawsuit to hold someone publicly accountable for what they've done, and to make a public record of it, and you don't want to have a private settlement, that is a perfectly legitimate and valid goal. And a lawyer that you hire for that purpose should be prepared to go forward and present the claim without necessarily even sending a demand letter. Most survivors do want, in my experience, I think it'd be the experience of people on the panel, but I don't wanna speak for everyone. Most survivors do want to make some sort of an attempt to try to avoid litigation if possible. And I think you've heard already about the difficulties associated with litigation. I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more as well. It is something in most cases to be avoided, but not it's not something to be avoided for everyone. And so as a survivor, that is perfectly legitimate if you direct your lawyer to um, not uh, make contact before filing suit. Now, if you do go the route of sending um, a, a letter to invite settlement discussions, that could take place lawyer to lawyer. Um, it also can take place in the context of a mediation. And mediation is something that um, I know that all of my colleagues on this panel have uh, participated in, in on many occasions. And we, you know, we can have a several hour panel discussion about what mediation looks like, but generally speaking, um, it is a voluntary non-binding process that with the assistance of a professional mediator, and there are many good ones um, in the New York area and, and around the country, um, to try to get the parties to come to some sort of consensus and some sort of an agreement to resolve the claims without having to file a lawsuit. Um, mediation can be very empowering for survivors because it gives them an opportunity if they want to speak in the mediation process, both to the mediator and potentially to the other side if they, they choose to. Um, and it's also an important um, process because um, you can keep, as a survivor, um, you can be safe. 
and um, there's no requirement to participate in any particular way. So if you have a lawyer who has experience in these kind of cases, um, the mediation can be structured either in person or these days often on Zoom in a way that doesn't require the survivor to have um, direct contact with um, the perpetrator and to create a space where the survivor feels safe in the process and has a chance to tell their story and what happened to them. Um, in many cases, mediation is successful in getting cases to resolve. I think that that's probably the experience of all of the lawyers here. Um, but of course, there are cases that are not resolvable. And so if you've made an attempt um, to try to resolve the case, and then it do that does not um, succeed, your option, of course, and, and the ASA gives the option um, to file suit regardless of how long ago the events took place. Cases that were previously barred by the statute of limitations are now not. Um, litigation, um, filing a lawsuit. So this is obviously a topic that could be discussed for, for quite some time. I'm going to try to really um, distill the essential elements of what litigation looks like. First of all, you file a complaint, right? The person initiating the lawsuit um, files a document that just describes, generally speaking, what the essential facts are of the case and the legal theories, right? Um, after that, so there will be some cases where the defendants try to get the case dismissed um, on some argument that the, the legal theories that the plaintiff are relying on are not valid under the law. And so sometimes there's initial um, motion practice. Um, basically, that's a fancy way of saying, you know, lawyers trying to argue to the judge to have the case stay in court or to have dismissed. After that's resolved, if that happens, and that doesn't happen in every case, um, the, the next major step in a lawsuit um, is in civil cases, what is, I, I think it's fair to say, um, the, the, the sort of the, the meat of the process, which is called discovery, right? And maybe it's a concept that um, people have heard of. And discovery is, as it sounds, right, a process by which each side gets to try to get information that they don't have um, about the, the, the claims and the potential defenses of the other side. So um, again, very generally speaking, um, discovery can be divided into one part of trying to get documents. And by documents these days, of course, we mean electronic um, documents, text messages, emails, um, um, instant messages, all those types of things. And, um, and collecting documents from the other side that you'd be entitled to, and not just from the other side, but also potentially from third parties that may have um, documents that are relevant to the case. Sending subpoenas, those are all things that are potentially available to a plaintiff trying to prove their claim. Um, after all the documents have been collected, you get into the process of um, what's known as depositions. And depositions are um, pretrial testimony that um, every witness, if, if they're called for a deposition, has to give under oath. And it's not testifying in a courtroom, it typically takes place in a conference room um, with a court reporter present um, and just the attorneys and not a judge. But the, the person who's being deposed has to answer the questions under oath of the deposing lawyer um, about the nature of the claims. Now, I don't wanna sugarcoat this for someone who's bringing a lawsuit, a plaintiff in these cases, um, being deposed is not pleasant, right? Um, you have basically, you're being questioned by lawyers, often skilled lawyers for the other side um, for as much as seven, eight hours um, in a day um, who are trying to disprove your claims and trying to find holes in your story. And it's, it's not a lot of fun. But the good thing is, is that you have your lawyer with you, right? And, and the lawyer is there to advocate and make sure the questions are fair and appropriate and not beyond the bounds of what's permitted. Um, and it can be empowering because it's an opportunity for the plaintiff to say their truth and tell exactly what happened to them, to the people who um, represent the, uh, the people who harm them. So I have had clients who, although they might have been um, fearful of what the deposition was like after that, when it was over, felt very empowered um, once it was done and felt that they were relieved that they were able to finally tell their story um, under oath. And so 
The only other thing I'd say about depositions is that the most important piece of it is the preparation beforehand. And that's why you want to work with a lawyer. Um, one of the reasons why you want to work with a lawyer who has experience in these cases um, to be able to prepare you as to what to expect. Um, once the depositions are concluded, that's the discovery process. Then typically speaking, there's in, in a lot of these cases, there's yet another attempt by the defendants to try to have it dismissed. Those are called summary judgment motions. Again, that could be another whole panel discussion. Um, but in any event, it's basically more wrangling between lawyers. It's not something that survivors typically have to get involved in um, themselves. And if the case has not settled at that point, and a lot of cases do settle by that point, if they've gone that far, you have a trial. And everyone knows what a trial is. Um, I would just say that for the, it's one thing to emphasize for these civil cases, because as been discussed, these are not criminal cases. The burden of proof for someone bringing a civil case is not as high as you might have heard as in a criminal case. So whereas in a criminal case, the elements of the claim must be proved beyond the reasonable doubt, that is not the standard in a civil case. You have to prove by what's called a preponderance of evidence um, that what you're contending happened, happened. And that just means more likely than not. So that gives um, a lot more um, strength and, and potentially um, chance for success for survivors and lawyers bring these cases because they don't have quite the level of proof that they would in a criminal context. So I hope that that provides a general overview of what the process is like. All of these elements you know, could, could be discussed for a lot longer, but that is in, in very big broad strokes what the process looks like. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, just a note that we have about a little less than 15 minutes left and we have about four questions left. So we're gonna ask folks to be uh, uh, concise in their answers. I wanna ask Carrie, um, and I think Kevin sort of hinted at it about some of the risks that may come from filing a civil lawsuit, but also just if, if Carrie, if you can follow up to a question uh, that came up during uh, Kevin's discussion uh, about depositions, is there um, a limit on the amount of time that a victim must answer questions in any given day? What does that process look like a little bit more concretely? Thanks, Carrie. Sure. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, just talking about the very serious conversations that I have with clients um, before I even agree to take their case, um, because litigation is, is a true journey. Um, it has its highs and its lows. And clients um, walk into most of our offices saying that they want justice. Um, but what I tell my clients is that at the end of the day, that's not something that courts can really dispense. Um, courts dispense money and justice is a perspective. Um, and the process of litigation, um, grueling as it is, um, is really not worthwhile um, for most people unless we can actually recover money for them at the end of it, because it is just so emotionally taxing. Um, abusers have the right to defend themselves and their toolbox of defense usually involves attacking the, the plaintiff's credibility, their memory, um, saying that they should have come forward sooner. Um, and as Marianne said, you are literally engaging in combat with uh, your abuser, the person who may have caused you the most trauma in your life. And so it's so important that um, people that are walking into this process um, are, are steeled up for everything that, that it entails. Um, and even the process of settlement can be insulting with lowball offers and um, haggling over terms and, and being pressured um, by the other side to have uh, non-disclosure and, and non-disparagement terms in the, in the agreements, which often um, is something that um, clients are willing to do because um, they've made priority choices about, about what they want. Um, so the um, discovery process can be kind of the, the, the most grueling part of, um, of the litigation. Um, as Kevin talked about, um, it's the part where parties exchange information about the claims, and this can be um, this can mean turning over therapy records, emails, texts, um, and providing access um, to the abuser's counsel 
um, to witnesses uh, that you spoke to about, about what happened um, and being interviewed in a, in a deposition. And in New York, I believe that, I mean, it's pretty standard for depositions to never be longer than, than seven hours. Um, uh, but in New York, I don't think that there is, is a limit, but um, they, sh they should never go longer than seven hours. Um, but but the, the experience of, of being examined and asked questions by, by the defense lawyer um, for seven hours can be really, really tricky and something that um, any lawyer is going to prepare the client for. Another risk that people talk to me about is whether they can be, whether they can be sued. And um, the risk is, is whether the um, abuser is going to bring counterclaims. Typically, uh, the most frequent counterclaim that we see is for defamation. Um, relating to um, the survivor having told people about the abuse. Um, the ASA does not res resurrect or expand the statute of limitation on defamation claims. Um, that doesn't mean that it won't still be used. Um, and fortunately, um, the, the claims in the complaint, in the four corners of the complaint, those are not subject to defamation um, claims. Uh, because of the litigation privilege that protects the speech that's contained in lawsuits. Um, people ask if they will owe money if they lose. Um, if the case is valid and it's not found by a court to be frivolous um, and there's no valid counterclaims against the survivor, then there's not a great threat of, of owing money. Um, some lawyer agreements say that um, uh, clients are responsible for the costs and expenses, uh, like depositions and experts, and uh, some lawyers want to be refunded those those costs. Um, but that will be spelled out in in the retainer agreement. And um, the last thing I want to hit is just um, the issue of of privacy, um, which is one of the biggest um, concerns that many of my clients have. And what we can all do is. Um, we can file motions for our clients to proceed anonymously. And we do that at the very onset of the case. And um, it's, it's um, never a sure thing. And there's been some rollback um, that's not been favorable lately, but the ultimate inquiry um, for the court is whether the plaintiff has a substantial privacy right, which outweighs the customary and constitutionally embedded presumption of openness in judicial proceedings. So we, the, the status quo is that everyone um, files lawsuits publicly and the legal papers are accessible to the public. Um, but there, there are exceptions in cases um, where, where the, um, the plaintiff is a sexual assault survivor. And there's also um, just a journalistic code of conduct where journalists do not say the name of uh, plaintiffs in sexual assault cases um, unless the plaintiff has previously um, discussed the, 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 um, the case themselves. Um, uh, but courts can consider a, a number of factors when they're making the determination and really it ultimately comes down to the to lawyers um, just uh, justifying that the need for privacy is not just to avoid the annoyance and, and criticism that attends litigation, um, but that the case involves a serious matter of privacy that needs to be preserved and is of a highly personal, highly sensitive matter. And there really is nothing that's more highly personal or highly sensitive than um, you know, sexual privacy and and uh, sexual harms, um, but you know, embarrassment or economic harm to the plaintiff will not suffice to, to show um, that that anonymity is, is justified. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it leave it there. Carrie, that was great. Thank you. There are so many um, risks to coming forward, and you certainly outlined a lot of them. So thank you. Um, it's one thing that. A lot of survivors when they're coming forward kind of think how the heck am i going to 
um, list out the, the events that happened and the times they happened. And then it's, is it just, he said, she said. And so establishing corroboration around the events that happened. Jeff, can you talk to us a little bit about how this is done, the need for this and thoughts you have on that? Sure. So, um, and I'm going to do the two minute version of this because I know we're a little limited in time. Um, I highly support that. Thanks. I'm going to give you a lawyer answer. Uh, corroboration, sometimes it's needed, sometimes it's not needed. And the important thing is this, is it's not always needed. It's helpful. It can be helpful. Corroboration is where there are other witnesses that maybe the survivor spoke to. Maybe they wrote notes, diaries, journals. Maybe there's text messages, emails, letters, photographs, all these things. Sometimes they exist, sometimes they don't exist, but there could still be a case if there is no what we consider corroboration. And the bottom line on this thing is that it's important for survivors. Every case is different. There's no one size fits all approach to this. And it's important for survivors to speak to experienced attorneys to figure out, hey, maybe I can bring a case, even if there's, you know, no witnesses who could corroborate what happened. Typically, you know, abusers don't abuse their victims in the presence of anybody, but you don't need that. So for example, if the employer of that perpetrator or, or some other person who had sort of supervisory responsibilities, if they were negligent in the first place and they should have been supervising either the perpetrator or the, or the victim and they didn't do their job, well, we don't need to have you know, evidence of what we call notice that this guy or this woman was a problem. Um, it's just that that institution was negligent in the first place. So um, don't hold back from talking to somebody to find out if you might have a case, even if there is no corroboration to support uh, the case itself. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, moving right along, uh, Kat, a question for you, and I know this has come up uh, particularly for a case that you've been working on. Sometimes in the course of all of this, the person who caused harm passes away. Um, what happens then? What resources or what um, availability does a plaintiff have in a case where that might have taken place? Sure, yes. Uh, you cannot sue a dead person. We call them a decedent. However, um, you can sue the estate of a decedent if that estate is open and there's a personal representative and an estate to sue. You also, we saw this a lot with Child Victim Act cases, and it kind of goes with the corroboration. You know, people worry about, well, my abuser's not even uh, alive anymore. What do I do? You know, how am I going to uh, bring my case forward? Um, you know, and we do see that with the clergy cases, you know, the churches, the institution, the diocese were sued, even though, um, you know, the majority of the priests had uh, passed away. So you can still bring against a negligent institution. Um, I had a case with a, um, where I was, a, uh, we sued the perpetrator directly and the perpetrator died in 2021. So we have to do some procedures so that we could sue the estate and they substitute in and stand in the shoes of. Um, uh, as far as corporations, what if the corporation's dead, so to speak? Um, and you do need, as we've all said, an experienced attorney that could bring in uh, that institution and what we call hopefully the successor institution. Sometimes, like we've had a case where there was a camp and they switched hands. Um, and so when the abuse happened, it was a different camp, they claimed. Um, but we were able to successfully argue that, no, 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 you were basically the same camp. You're not you're not fooling anybody like that old camp. You are in the same you have stepped in the shoes of the old camp. Um, so you just have to really argue your case and make it clear from the record and from the documents that. Uh, a new institution is basically the old one. I'm oversimplifying that. Um, and then the only thing I do want to say is since February 2021, depositions are capped at seven hours. Awesome. Um, thanks for that. So I think a lot of people, hopefully, that are watching and learning from this um, webinar know some of the work we've done from the CVA, the Child Victims Act. 
So Marianne, in the few minutes we have remaining, would you be able just to talk a little bit about the interplay between the Child Victims Act, the Adult Survivors Act, uh, the Adult Survivors Act and Gender Motivated Violence Act, and just how that all comes together for folks? Sure, I'm happy to, and I'm, I'll keep it very brief. Um, the main thing is to ask your lawyer and remind them um, if if you have, so the Child Victims Act revived claims um, of sexual abuse for anyone below 18, um, and the Adult Survivors Act is reviving civil claims for sexual abuse if you were 18 or older. Um, and so uh, obviously, unfortunately, often grooming um, may start in childhood and may extend beyond um, it, it, the age of 18 um, into adulthood or even for, for decades sometimes. But um, in, in any event, if you already have a CVA case going on um, and the abuse extended past the age of 18, you should talk to your lawyer or um, explore that, but in all likelihood, the best practice will be amending your complaint and adding ASA claims, because remember, the ASA window only opens on November 24th of this year, and so you can only start your case um, after November 24th. Um, and um, if, you know, if you have also, if the abuse began before you were 18 and you're only realizing now about the ASA, the good news is you have the ASA. Unfortunately, the window for the CBA is closed, so you probably can't necessarily pursue those claims, but obviously it's part of the narrative and it will be coming in in the ASA um, lawsuit if you file one. Um, and the other thing just to bear in mind is there's a lot of other laws um, that exist. And so just talk to your lawyer about it. And it is one of the reasons why having somebody who's very experienced working on se sexual abuse specifically is um, useful because it's actually fairly complicated. For instance, the Gender Motivated Violence Act is a is an act that is in New York City. Some other localities are considering them throughout the state, but really right now it's only in New York City. And there's a revival window for the New York City Gender Motivated Violence Act that starts on March first 2023 so it's all and and what is gender motivated violence versus sexual abuse how does that that's sometimes case law defined the point is it's fairly complicated and defined by these statutes and your lawyer should be looking at them every time i start a new case i look back at the law because there's no there's never any easy answer and each set of facts is different so you always want to be sure that you're doing it right I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Marianne. Um, and thank you to everybody. This has been so helpful um, for those of us who get so many questions from survivors, whether people are calling Safe Horizons hotline or uh, uh, sending us emails or reaching out to any of us. Uh, it's so great to be able to have a set of questions and a set of answers that hopefully can help steer survivors as they consider whether or not to file a civil lawsuit under the Adult Survivors Act. So thank you all for participating. Um, um, I also would be remiss if I didn't thank our wonderful bill sponsors, Assembly Member Linda Rosenthal, State Senator Brad Hoyleman. They are absolute warriors for this cause. They sponsor the Child Victims Act. They sponsor the Adult Survivors Act. Um, and it was through their leadership and their fortitude that we were able to get these bills through. And we are also so indebted to our incredible coalition of survivors and advocates from all across New York State who never gave up on this bill, who fought and fought year after year until we could get this bill across the finish line. Um, and we thank Governor Hochul for signing the bill into law the very day after, the very next day after the bill passed. So thank you to everyone. For people who want more information, uh, Laura had mentioned the uh, National Crime Victim Bar Association. Um, the uh, uh, website, which I have on my uh, uh, thing here, is uh, victimbar.org. You can go to victimbar.org and uh, be connected uh, through a referral service. You can also go to safehorizon.org backslash Adult Survivors Act to learn more about the Adult Survivors Act and what it may uh, offer you. So thank you uh, to everyone. Bridie, would you like to say a few last words? Um, I want to thank you, Michael, for all the work that you've done. Thanks for all the attorneys that have come on and to 
all the survivors out there that are looking at this and considering whether or not to proceed. Um, it's a big decision to make, but it's only a decision for a short period of time. And I think one of the best things about uh, the Child Victims Act passing, the Adult Survivors Act passing, is that we no longer have to Google this stuff at home in the dark. So WebMD is no longer how we need to figure out things. There are plenty of lawyers that are um, able and willing to answer the phone and have knowledge and now plenty of experience after the Child Victims Act's been open. And um, I'd even extend that if there's any way that I can be helpful um, to anyone to feel free to reach out to me directly. And I believe me, I understand how hard these decisions are. And if there's any way I can help someone navigate that, I'm willing and able and, and here for that. So thanks to everyone for coming together on the panel. Michael, of course, thanks for organizing. I don't know how you do everything you do. And um, keep sending us questions. We'll do another one of these to keeping the, the public updated on, on information. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Thank you thank so you much, Brian. Michael, for organizing. Thank you, thank you. Bye, team. Is it over? Yeah. <laughs>